Richard II had been the last legitimate King of England, if there was such a thing. He'd been succeeded by his murderer, Henry Bolingbroke, the father of Henry V, the grandfather of Henry VI. They were all descended from John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster. But that wasn't the legitimate line of descent. John of Gaunt had an elder brother whose descendants were still alive. The rightful King of England had not been Henry IV, but Edmund, the Earl of March. And now that Edmund was dead, it was his nephew, Richard, Duke of York. Edmund had carefully and probably wisely never made a point of making his claim. Henry IV and Henry V had been seriously powerful men, but Henry VI wasn't in the same league. His interest was not in war but in learning. He founded Eton and King's College Cambridge, and he was a gentle, pious man. There were many who believed that he was more a saint than a king. Richard, Duke of York, now 40 years old, decided that it was time for the crown to fall into his hands. His claim was supported by most of the barons of southern England. The northern barons felt all this was codswallop. They had the right to choose their king, not be passed like slaves to whoever inherited them. And then, quite suddenly in the summer of 1453, the king went mad. He'd probably inherited the strain of madness in his mother's family the illness that had racked Charles VI. The true legacy of Agincourt was not the crown of France, but a recurring disease that would afflict members of the English royal family for centuries. He lost his memory. He lost control of his body. He lost the ability to speak coherently or understand what was said to him. His wife gave birth to their only son, but he knew nothing about it. With the king incapacitated, government needed to be handed to a regent, and the man with the backing in the south to take over the reins was Richard, Duke of York. The inevitable and disastrous outcome was civil war, Lancaster against York. Their badges, the Red Rose of Lancaster and the White Rose of York, gave history the Wars of the Roses. To begin with, it was a war for control, not of the crown, but of the king. Richard didn't want to be crowned while Henry was still alive, nor did he want to kill him, but he did want to control the government and be recognized as Henry's successor. The king made a partial recovery, but was quite incapable of taking charge of his own defense. His queen made an impressive effort to do it for him. Margaret commanded in the Battle of Wakefield in 1460, when Richard of York was killed. Richard's son, Edward of York, had none of his father's qualms about taking the crown. In March 1461, Edward, without any parliamentary approval, had himself crowned Edward IV. Henry was still alive, a husk and became a refugee with his queen. The deposed royal family hid in Scotland. Then Henry was captured and became a prisoner in London. In 1470, an extraordinary upheaval backed by the King of France drove Edward IV from London and Henry was rescued from prison and restored to his throne. It's said that while Edward plotted his return from exile in Holland, Henry had a curious interview with one of his distant relatives, a boy of 14, Henry Tudor. After the death of his father, Henry VI's mother, Catherine de Valois, had an affair with one of her servants, a Welshman, Owen ap Maraduth ap Tudor. It was probably King Henry who arranged the marriage of their son, Edmund Tudor, to Margaret Beaufort, a great-grandchild of John of Gaunt, Margaret became pregnant immediately. But the Beaufort family were disbarred by ancient royal charters from ever succeeding to the throne. So why did she call her baby Henry? No Beaufort had ever been called Henry. No Tudor had ever been called Henry. It was a king's name. It suggests that Owen had great plans for the boy. And that was obviously what Edward of York thought. As soon as he had Owen Tudor in his power, in 1461, he had his head chopped off. His head was displayed, lit up with a hundred candles. <laughs> 
Henry Tudor, aged four, had been taken prisoner. But now, young Tudor was free, and according to later stories, was looked on as an important figure in the line of succession. According to Shakespeare, Henry VI looked at the boy and said, Lo, surely this is he to whom both we and our adversaries shall hereafter give place. The following year, Edward IV made his counter-strike. King Henry's son was killed at the Battle of Tewkesbury, and Henry VI himself was captured. A few days later, he was murdered in the Tower of London. The Wars of the Roses were over. The competition between England's barons for control of the kingdom had ground to a bloody end, with most of the great families of nobles having been slaughtered. Henry Tudor was now head of the House of Lancaster. He had no claim to the throne, of course, coming from the debarred Beaufort family, so Edward should not have regarded him as a threat, in theory. Just to be on the safe side, he fled to Brittany. But Henry Tudor would be back, and he would make sure he controlled how the story was written. And all these figure in the story I'm telling now, the story of the Tudors. Above all, though, the story of this great dynasty of rulers is a tale of passionate love affairs and what happens when love and high politics collide. The story begins with Owen Tudor, a hugely ambitious and very handsome young man. His father was an outlaw hiding out in the Welsh hills, but Owen managed to get employed as a servant in the household of the infant Henry VI. Now, this household was run by Henry's mother, Queen Catherine de Valois, a very sexy widow, who fell for Owen completely. There's no record that they ever got married, but they did have five children. When Catherine died in 1437, Henry VI was still only 13, and the barons who ran the kingdom in his name put Owen in prison. But when Henry came of age, he brought his stepfather, Owen Tudor, back to court and gave earldoms to his stepbrothers, Edmund and Jasper Tudor. Owen ensured Edmund's marriage to a girl from Henry's family. Edmund died very soon after the marriage, but his 13-year-old bride, Margaret Beaufort, was already pregnant. Their son was born at Pembroke Castle. He was named after the king, Henry Tudor. And Owen had a grandson with a blood connection to the House of Lancaster, the family of the king. They weren't actually the legitimate line. Henry of Lancaster, Henry Bolingbroke, had deposed his cousin Richard II in 1399 to become Henry IV. The thrones of his son and grandson, Henry V and VI, rested on that shaky foundation, which crumbled in the Wars of the Roses when the true heirs to the throne, the House of York, began to battle for their inheritance. Owen Tudor stood squarely with the Henrys, the Lancastrians. That, after all, was where he had invested all his hopes. He fought for them, and in 1461, died for them. Beheaded by Yorkists in Hereford Marketplace. He was the last Tudor to lose his head. But as we all know, the Tudors would take up this approach to problem-solving themselves, you might say, with a vengeance. Edward of York seized the throne, Edward IV, and Owen's four-year-old grandson, Henry Tudor, began what would be decades of living on the run or as a refugee. But three years later, King Edward did something that would eventually give Henry Tudor everything Owen had wished for. He fell in love, and that began a chain of events which altered all England's history. <laughs> 
When Edward was about 20, he was waylaid by an attractive widow of about 25 who was trying to recover her late husband's property. Edward, six foot three tall and really very good looking, wanted to help, and he became besotted. It seems she persuaded him to secretly enter into a contract to marry her. Her name was Eleanor Butler. About a year later, in 1464, another attractive widow, 26 years old, pulled the same stunt, and Edward did it again. Unbelievable! This time the lady was called Elizabeth Woodville, and this time it wasn't just a contract to marry, it was a full marriage to a commoner. When Elizabeth Woodville was crowned in Westminster Abbey, the whole of Europe was scandalised. Marriage was all about alliances of power and property. Marrying a penniless woman for love was simply disgusting. The negotiators trying to arrange a proper royal marriage were humiliated. And when Edward heaped honours, wealth and titles on Elizabeth's relatives, the Rivers family, the nobility of England were outraged. They were, quite frankly, getting completely above themselves. If anyone had known about Edward's promise to marry Eleanor Butler, things would have been even worse. But she was quietly shut up in a convent and died in 1468. As it was, Edward lost so much support that in 1470 he was actually driven out of England and Henry VI came back to the throne. A few months later, Edward came back into London and regained the crown thanks to the strong support of London merchants to whom he owed money and even more, it was said, of their wives and daughters who really seemed to have found him romantically interesting. Which, face it, Henry VI certainly wasn't. Unless you fancied an elderly saintly scholar who'd lost his mind. In the battles that followed, Henry's son, another Edward, was killed and King Henry himself captured, disappeared into a prison and was never seen again. The whole male line of the House of Lancaster, the descendants of the sons of John of Gaunt, was now extinct. Except for one fragile thread, Margaret Beaufort and her 15-year-old son, Henry Tudor. Not that they had any claim to the crown. Of course, the Lancaster dynasty had begun by simply usurping the throne, but on top of that, Margaret's grandfather was illegitimate. A law had been passed to make him legitimate, but it also barred him and his descendants from the succession. And that would probably have been that, if it hadn't have been for Edward's little secret, which didn't emerge until Edward himself was dead. He was only 41 when he fell ill and died. His son, the Prince of Wales, also called Edward, was just 12 years old. Everyone refers to this young man as Edward V, but he was never crowned. The dead king's will was clear. Prince Edward would be his successor, of course, but he would be in the care of a guardian and protector of the kingdom. That person was Edward IV's brother, Richard, Duke of Gloucester. We all know him as the most evil king in English history, the warped and twisted Richard III. Richard had been in effect King Edward's vice-regent in the north, based in the city of York, and no one at that time said anything bad about him at all. But the Queen thought there was someone even better to run her son's kingdom. Her. King Edward IV had died at Westminster. Elizabeth immediately sent her brother and other members of her household rushing up to Ludlow, where Prince Edward was staying. The idea was to hustle him to London and install him before Richard even knew what was going on. Then she and her family, the Rivers, would have control of everything. Richard, of course, did find out what was going on and said he would meet up with the party as they brought the prince through Northampton. Okay? Okay. Except that when he got to Northampton, he found that the Rivers didn't have the prince with them. Alarmed, Richard took them prisoner and found their baggage stuffed with arms and armour. There was plainly an attempt being made at a coup. Richard nipped it in the bud. He found they'd secreted the prince in Stony Stratford, 
Elizabeth's family home. This was before blue plaques had been invented. Richard escorted the prince to London and installed him in the Tower of London while he set about organising the coronation. And then came the bombshell. The dead king's contract to marry Eleanor Butler had been made in front of a priest, who now decided it was time to speak. Oops! If Edward really had been betrothed to Eleanor, his marriage to Elizabeth Woodville was bigamy and the young prince couldn't be king because he was illegitimate. Was this true? This man, Robert Stillington, was no ordinary priest. Edward had promoted him and trusted him, making him a bishop and keeper of the Privy Seal and then Chancellor of England. But then Stillington became awfully friendly with King Edward's ambitious brother, the Duke of Clarence, and Clarence could not be trusted an inch. If Edward's children were illegitimate, Clarence would be next in line to the throne. Edward quickly had his brother sentenced to death and executed in private with no chance to make a public statement. Instead, the world was told Clarence had drowned in a butt of Malmsey, a barrel of sweet wine. Such a sad accident. And Stillington spent a year locked in the tower. After his release, perhaps nervous of the power of strong drink, he kept his mouth shut until Edward was dead. But now he spoke, and Parliament believed him. With Edward's children illegitimate and Clarence's disinherited when he was executed, Richard was left as the proper successor. He reluctantly accepted. Well, he accepted. And the Tower of London changed from the Prince of Wales's palace into his prison. He shared it with his brother. Neither was ever seen again. Did Richard have them killed? No one knows, but later the evidence was going to be shaped as far as possible to make him guilty. He's been said to have personally killed Henry VI and Henry's son, whose widow he married, and done the dirty deed with Clarence and the Malmsey, quite apart from the murder of the princes in the Tower. The picture of Richard that's come down to us, the hunchbacked, sinister and ruthless tyrant, is a caricature painted after he'd been deposed and immortalized by the Tudor's greatest propagandist, William Shakespeare. One of the buildings inside the Tower of London was even given the name the Bloody Tower to associate it with Richard's foul murder of the princes, though they almost certainly were in a different building anyway. He'd certainly been a popular figure in the north of England, where his brother had charged him with healing the divisions of the Wars of the Roses. But it only took four months for a rebellion to emerge against him. The rival candidate was, of course, the boy across the water, now not such a boy, Henry Tudor. The House of York was now as extinct as the House of Lancaster. Henry Tudor was all there was for disappointed Yorkists as well as Lancastrians. And there were plenty of disappointed Yorkists. Richard gave positions, power and wealth to men he trusted, whom he'd got to know in the north of England, leaving a lot of southerners out in the cold who thought they could do much better under a more sympathetic figure. And now he came. With a force of 2,000 refugees and French soldiers, Owen Tudor's grandson landed at Milford Haven in Wales on the 1st of August, 1485. Three weeks later, when he came to do battle at Bosworth, his force had grown by just 3,000 men. Richard came to the battlefield as rightful King of England. Before the battle began, he held a coronation ceremony, restating his right of true succession to the crown, a right which Henry Tudor did not possess at all. Actually, given the fact that his family was specifically barred from the succession, he had pretty much less claim than anyone else there. But that's not how things were working out. The crown of England was found lying under a bush at the end of the Battle of Bosworth and placed on Henry Tudor's head. And Henry understood how you rule England. Not by winning over great nobles, they'd pretty well all been wiped out, but by winning over public opinion. The pen is mightier than the sword, especially when it tells the story of what happened. <laughs> 